Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Paleontology Fringe Theories Iceberg. I'm super excited for this episode because the last one we did was my favorite one to work on so far due to how weird and interesting some of the entries were. And that was only the first part of Tier 3, so surely that means things are only going to get weirder from here. But before we start, I do want to say that another version of the iceberg was made, which compared to the version that I'm covering now, it's much more organized and cleaner, and it's even given a much more fitting name of Weird Paleontology. I'm bringing this up just in case people are wondering if I may transition to that version of the iceberg for this series, and the answer is no. I'm too far into this version to just jump ship now. So even if this iceberg isn't as organized or doesn't have topics that are as well fitted with its name, that's just something I'm going to have to deal with. But if you want to take a look at an iceberg chart that's more tidy, I recommend checking out Sustained Disgust's new version of the Paleontology Fringe Theories iceberg. If you also wanted to discover other avenues of learning while you're at it, then look no further than Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant is an online learning program specialized in guiding and teaching a variety of subjects revolved around STEM-based classes like science, computer science, and mathematics. In the last few months that I've been trying out Brilliant, it's been a very fun and even relaxing experience since the whole point of it is to interact with you and guide you through the courses at a pace that works for you. You don't have to be an expert in these courses to get into this online program because Brilliant accommodates for any level of knowledge as the whole point of Brilliant is to help improve your problem solving skills that are necessary to your day to day life. So even if you're a beginner, you can find something that works for you. I mean, that should be easy to do considering they have 60 plus courses to choose from. Surely you'll be able to find something that fits your interest, whether it's math like geometry, algebra, math history, probability, and so on, or maybe science-based topics like physics, astrophysics, quantum mechanics, and more, or computer sciences like algorithms, data, programming, and many others. And of course, you know that Brilliant still has that deal going on where the first 200 people who click on the link at the very top of the description below gets 20% off an annual membership, so definitely go check that out and apply today. Once again, 20% off an annual membership for the first 200 people that check out the link in the description below. Thank you so much to Brilliant once again for sponsoring today's video and helping out the channel. I greatly appreciate it, and with that, let's get into today's video. Mostrogen sea level regression killed the dinosaurs. This one's pretty simple. Basically, there was a point in the Cretaceous period where sea levels were regressing, which is thought to have been a contributor in the dinosaurs' extinction, due to the amount of extreme environmental and climate conditions it would have caused. Not only would this have killed off a lot of the prehistoric marine life close to the surface, but it also could have caused the land to become a lot drier and hotter, possibly being drastic enough to kill off the dinosaurs. Archaeopteryx Faked English astronomer Fred Hoyle and British mathematician Chandra Rikramasinghe wrote a book in 1968 titled Archaeopteryx the Primordial Bird, A Case of Fossil Forgery. Basically, the whole point of this book was to provide the evidence to suggest that the Archaeopteryx was a fraud and was actually a dinosaur fossil with feathers forged around it to make it look bird-like. More specifically, it was thought that chicken feathers were pressed into plaster, then laid onto the fossil of a Compsognathus specimen. While I couldn't tell you what arguments they made in this book since I myself have never read it, I can say that one of the reasons why they made the argument is because instead of evolution, Hoyle believes that dinosaurs and other animals from the Mesozoic era were essentially transformed into birds and mammals from rainstorms containing some sort of virus or bacteria that came from outer space, which would then affect the prehistoric fauna leading them to go through sudden changes that would eventually lead to the animals of the Cenozoic era. Of course, you can probably already imagine that this was definitely a rather controversial idea, and the book has had its fair share of criticism from the community. Margulis's Lesser Known Theories American biologist Lynn Margulis was a pretty well-known figure in the science community due to her several ideas and theories, many of which were considered to be pseudoscience and very fringe. As a result, a lot of her ideas were rejected and not taken very seriously, but this never really deterred her from speaking her mind, and she continued to develop ideas that were sort of hit or miss based on what I've read on her. 
Because of her more outside-the-box kind of thinking, she was seen as a scientific rebel who kind of disregarded the more traditional way of scientific thinking. And as you can already imagine, this would definitely make her a rather controversial figure in the community having theories like her HIV-AIDS theory, where she suggests that due to the overlap in symptoms between AIDS and syphilitics, and the lack of evidence to show that HIV is an infectious virus that causes AIDS, that AIDS is essentially essentially just syphilis, which led many people to call her out as an AIDS denier. She also co-developed the Gaia Hypothesis, which suggested that all living organisms work together with the inorganic parts of their environment to maintain control of their conditions of life which include things like global temperatures and ocean salinity. Then there's her metamorphosis theory, where she suggests that insect larvae and their adults did not evolve from a single common ancestor, and instead came from two completely different ancestors. And then she kind of takes a bit of a turn with things with her 9-11 theory, calling the 9-11 event, quote-unquote, the most effective television commercial in the history of Western civilization. That should probably tell you everything you need to know about that one, but just in case. She suggests that the buildings were brought down by controlled demolition, and it was done as so to give the US some sort of justification for the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. So yeah, maybe not the best takes in science or even the out of place 9-11 theory, depending on who you ask, but this doesn't dismiss some of her other ideas have actually been said to have contributed in a lot of good ways. For example, her serial endosymbiosis theory, which posits the origins of eukaryotic cells comes from the primitive prokaryotes engulfing different types of prokaryotes, creating a more complex version of the two. Repeat this process several more times and after obtaining different features and structures from previous prokaryotes, the advanced prokaryotes begins processing similar features to that of eukaryotes. While not taken very seriously at first, this idea has been more accepted nowadays. Cosmozoa in 1865, Richter proposed a theory that microscopic spores, or seeds that would be known as cosmozoa, would travel through space dust and make their way onto Earth, thus creating the origins of life. If this sounds familiar, it's because this was somewhat of a precursor to another theory that we already covered on here called panspermia. Basically, the point of these theories were to suggest that life did not begin here on Earth, but rather began somewhere else, presumably on another planet, and somehow made its way to Earth, where it would adapt and evolve into what we know today. Sauropod Trunks this is the idea that sauropods could have possessed a proboscis, or a trunk, similar to that of elephants, which is based on the similarities that the two have when it comes to nostril placement. Some sauropods, like Diplodocus, have a narial opening within their skulls that are in a similar position to that of animals that have trunks. The earliest example of this idea being brought up was through Walter Coombs' paper on the subject of sauropod lifestyles called Sauropod Habits and Habitats. While the idea didn't seem to gain huge traction, there are still plenty of examples of it being showcased in books, most likely to show off a piece of strange paleontological speculation. The trunked sauropod idea would expand, with some even suggesting certain macronarians had trunks as well. Just like Diplodocus, this is due to their high-positioned nares. However, the reason why this idea wasn't taken too seriously is because many believe there isn't really a point for sauropods to have a trunk at all. Sauropods had already developed the one feature they're mainly known for in order to reach their primary food source, that being of course their long necks. Along with this, reptiles in general don't have the same muscles needed to evolve a trunk as these muscles are mainly seen in mammals. Mammals also use their trunks to sense their environment and grasping and eating food. Reptiles have a completely different set of physical traits to perform those same tasks. So the sauropod trunk concept isn't taken very seriously in the scientific world, but as mentioned earlier, it definitely seems to have a place in speculative fiction. Jellyfish Evolved from Complex Organisms this one's a bit self-explanatory in that this is just a proposition that jellyfish appeared sometime much earlier than the Cambrian era, and possibly formed from organisms in the Ediacaran period. Underground Ocean 
Underground oceans have been used to support several different ideas and hypotheses over the years. One outdated theory is that the cause of tides is due to the ocean constantly circulating through subterranean seas. This idea has also been used in other ways, for example to support certain versions of Neptunism, which is the theory that the majority of certain rocks and minerals were formed by the crystallization of waters from a much more primitive ocean that would eventually deplete into large underground caves. Others have used the idea to support the cause of the Great Flood from Noah's Ark. As of recently, it seems that there has been some discovery of an underground ocean near Earth's core. Also finding out that the water had apparently been stored in an olivine mineral called ringwoodite, which is able to absorb and release it under certain conditions. United States versus One Tyrannosaurus Skeleton in 2012, after a Tarbosaurus skeleton was sold for $1 million at Heritage Auctions in New York, the government of Mongolia stepped in as the fossils had been illegally smuggled from their country. Mongolia is typically strict when it comes to materials like this as they deem it to be culturally significant and should not be removed from its country of origin without their permission. So the specimen was examined and concluded to have originated from Mongolia. Turns out the man behind the smuggling was Eric Prokopi, a name that I've mentioned here before on my channel in my video talking about the Nicolas Cage dinosaur skull incident in which Prokopi was briefly involved in. In this specific case that we're talking about now, he would take the skeleton from Mongolia and transport it to the United Kingdom, where he then imported it to the US. Prokopi claimed that he got the specimen from Great Britain, but a complaint from the United States Attorney's Office was filed and he was taken to court. The case was called United States vs. One Tyrannosaurus Batar Skeleton, probably due to some kind of communication error, I'm assuming. Maybe they thought Tyrannosaurus was close enough to Tarbosaurus and just kind of went with it. I don't really know. Anyways, Prokopi would end up losing this case, was jailed for three months for stealing and smuggling illegal goods, and the Tarbosaurus specimen, along with a couple of others he also had, were sent back to Mongolia. The one specifically associated with this case is now displayed in a museum in Darkhan. Waukesha's Butterfly Creature this refers to a strange fossilized arthropod found in the Waukesha Lagerstadt in Wisconsin and is dated to be from the Silurian period. What makes this creature so unique is that there's not much really known about it. It doesn't even seem to have a proper name. The closest thing it has to a name is butterfly animal, which is due to its side extensions giving it a butterfly-like appearance. But of course, with it being a part of the Silurian period, it obviously wasn't an actual butterfly, but possibly a type of crustacean due to its bivalved carapace and it would live in a marine environment. The lack of information surrounding this creature has made it one of the most mysterious organisms ever discovered. Burnett's Sacred Theory Around the 1680s, Thomas Burnett, an English theologian, wrote about his new idea that he called the Sacred Theory of the Earth. It's a biblical-based concept in which the Earth, considered to be the home of Eden, was at one point a perfect sphere. But due to the catastrophic Great Flood incident, it resulted in a dish-shaped world of mountains, valleys, oceans, and separated pieces of land, all of which ruined the Earth's once perfect shape. Burnett would write a book that went more in depth with this theory in 1681, which went by the same name, which is what he apparently was best known for. His theory would also involve the hollow earth idea, which he would use to explain where all of the water from the Great Flood came from, since all of the water on Earth's surface today was not enough to cause such a disaster. Armored Whales Zooglodon is a synonym name for Bastylosaurus and was initially given to the possible discovery of armored whales made by a Professor Dames who interpreted a Bastylosaurid fossil vertebrate as having qualities that led him to believe they possessed plating of some kind that were comparable to that of armadillos. And in case you couldn't pick up on it yet, Basilosaurids were a genus of marine mammals that were initially thought to have been lizard-like serpents, but it was eventually found out that they were instead a predatory group that branches from stem group whales. 
From the accounts that I've been reading, it seems that the story goes that fossils of what was thought to have been a large marine reptile was found in 1834 in Alabama. So it was given the name Basilosaurus only for it to be later confirmed to be a mammal. Then scientists began to speculate that maybe the remains belonged to a predatory whale that grew as long as 70 feet long known as Zuglodon, to which these remains were closely associated with during that time. Then, in an 1893 paper by Professor Dames, the idea of the whale being armored was brought up, which led to a lot of discourse amongst the community. But it was noted that the plates found near the fossil specimen were most likely remains of prehistoric leatherback turtles. On top of this, other scientists like paleontologist F.A. Lucas stated that Basilosaurus, or Zuglodon, was far too specialized to be ancestral to any living whales, thus making it irrelevant to any armor living species might or might not have. A. Fragilimus Rumors Amphicoelius fragilimus is a late Jurassic sauropod that was discovered by American paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope. This dinosaur has a pretty interesting history behind it that I'm not going to go through as it's a lot of information, but the relevant parts of that information that pertains to this specific entry are the fact that this dinosaur is known from one single piece of fossil evidence, more specifically a dorsal vertebrate that measured to be around 2.7 meters, which if it was fully reconstructed, it would have made it the biggest dinosaur in the world. The problem with this, however, is that that single fossil evidence has been missing for over a hundred years. Said to have been lost during the transportation to the rest of Cope's collection at the American Museum of Natural History, with only sketches of the fossil remaining. This has led people to become suspicious of Cope, making them wonder if the dorsal vertebrate was real at all, and if Cope's measurements were even correct or if they were just greatly exaggerated. As of right now, the Amphicoelius is no longer considered to be Amphicoelius because after a reanalysis of Cope's publication on it, and with the discovery of new sauropod specimens, it's concluded that the single fossil had traits that fit more in line with Rebaccasaurids, instead of the basal diplodocoid that it was initially thought to be. So its genus name had been replaced to Marapunosaurus fragilimus. Which is what the entry was initially titled, but I changed it because it felt more fitting since it was mainly referring to Aphrodilimus when it was still Aphrodilimus. Oh, and also, the dimensions for the dinosaur's size would be reworked, and the size estimates are much lower for Amphrodilimus than it was originally thought for Aphrodilimus. Pennine's Ghost Pterodactyl this entry is referring to the several alleged early 1980s sightings of a pterosaur-like animal soaring above the Pennines Moors, which is located around northern England. Some accounts have described this creature as a monster bird with a large wingspan ranging from about 6 to 10 feet. Other reports describe the pterosaur to be somewhat transparent, giving off the idea that not only could it have been a pterosaur, but a pterosaur apparition as well. Which I have to say, that's just, that's just the best thing in the goddamn world right now. The only thing aside from these reports about the creature that has resulted is a single image, which is extremely blurry, so I'll just leave it up to you guys. Do you think this creature exists? Dinosaur Extinction Caused by Poor Eyesight in 1982, British ophthalmologist L. R. Croft wrote a book called The Last Dinosaurs, where he suggested that they went extinct due to the increase of global temperatures, which in turn caused the increase in rate of cataract blindness that would greatly affect the dinosaurs. This of course would lead to poor eyesight, which would have served as a huge disadvantage for them, leading them to eventual starvation and extinction as a whole. According to Croft, the dinosaurs would have been blind before they they reach their reproductive stage in life. It doesn't seem like this one got very far in terms of garnering any attention though, so it's just one of those theories that kind of lie in obscurity. Martian Fossils in 1984, a piece of Martian meteorite was discovered in Allen Hills, Antarctica. Martian meteorites is a name given to rocks that originally formed on Mars, and sometimes some fragments of them will somehow end up here on Earth, which we have a few examples of. 
But this specific case was particularly interesting because in 1996, scientists would do a full analysis on the fragments and suggested that the carbonate materials could have been made by Martian microorganisms and on top of that discovered strange microscopic lines around the rock that resembled something close to a fossilized worm, which could potentially confirm the existence of extraterrestrial life. Of course, this was a controversial topic since a lot of people were obviously skeptical of a discovery like this. And the scientist responsible for the claim was David S. McKay. McKay dedicated a lot of his time to this Martian meteor and possible fossil, arguing for the possible existence of extraterrestrial life. Of course, a lot of scientists were rejecting these arguments. The bacteria, as they described it, that was discovered within this rock was said to be way too small to be able to even live, since they wouldn't be able to hold all of the necessary internal components to keep themselves alive. But McKay would retaliate to this argument by pointing out the presence of magnetite crystals, which some bacteria are able to produce. However, in 2001, a group of scientists, including McKay's own brother, actually tested whether or not these crystals could be produced inorganically. And they would manage to do exactly that, which pretty much throws McKay's magnetite crystals argument out the window, even though he thought otherwise. McKay was going to do more work on the rock to further support his ideas, but he would pass away in 2013, and the consensus is that there's nothing organic within this Martian rock. Dimetrodon is a direct human ancestor. I am seriously compelled to just leave this entry blank for the sole purpose of leaving people confused as hell. Because just imagine hearing this and just having no context. But anyways, what this entry is saying is that even though Dimetrodon is often said to be a dinosaur, whether it's from the general public that doesn't know any better or from memes that the paleo community themselves made, Dimetrodons are actually more closely related to mammals than they are to reptiles. Since they were a part of the synapsids group, which branched off to therapsids, which is the group that would give rise to the mammals. Obviously, this doesn't mean that dimetrodons are a direct ancestor to us, but they were cousins to mammals. But of course, some people don't fully understand this and immediately assume or imply that dimetrodons are direct ancestors to us when that's not the case at all. Glacial Cosmogony also known as the Ice World Theory, this idea actually originated from a vision that Austrian engineer Hans Horbiger had in 1894. According to him, ice was the base substance for every celestial object and process in the universe that materialized the moon, our planet, and even the entirety of the Milky Way. Some accounts of this idea say that Earth is surrounded by a large ice wall which is supported mainly by flat earthers, no surprise there. Because this idea didn't come from any means of scientific thinking but rather from a vision that one person had, it was largely discredited. Hutton's Abyss of Time. James Hutton, also known as the father of geology, would travel to Sakar Point in Scotland by boat where he would notice something interesting about the rock formation. He noticed the distinct connection made between two different types of rocks which would indicate the two types had been separated in age by a great span of time. This went against the biblical based idea that the earth was only a few thousand years old, and Hutton would use this physical evidence to argue against exactly that, concluding that the earth was much, much older than that. Thanks to his contributions, scientists now recognize that these formations are caused by millions of years worth of erosion and natural wear and that said changes were caused at a very slow rate. This idea would have a couple of different names including deep time and uniformitarianism, which the specific definition to that second one is that Earth's geological processes acted in a similar fashion in the past as they do now and act in a uniform cycle that accounts for the geological changes it has undergone. But another name was eventually given to this idea which is the abyss of time, which seemed to have been inadvertently created by one of Hutton's boat companions, John Playfair. During the initial trip to Sakar Point, he stated, the mind seemed to grow giddy by looking far into the abyss of time. Koa Liker's Heterogenesis 
Heterogenesis was an idea that seemed to have been originally brought up by this French naturalist whose name I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce. We'll just call him Jeffrey. Jeffrey accepted and supported the theory of saltationism, which as I explained previously is the theory of what is basically best described as instantaneous evolution where the process of speciation could potentially happen in a single step. Heterogenesis is basically that, but Jeffrey's idea, which didn't have the title of heterogenesis yet, was that this fast rate evolution could have been caused by extreme environmental pressures. Jeffrey's theory would later be revived by Swiss embryologist Albert von Koaliker in 1864. And it was part of a set of ideas, which were the multiple origins of living forms, the internal causes of variation, and sudden leaps, which is heterogenesis, in the evolutionary process. Koa Liker also apparently didn't believe it was environmental pressures that caused this form of evolution, but rather an individual organism that was heterogenetic that would essentially birth a new species entirely. Venomous Dinosaur Back in 2009, a group of paleontologists including Enpu Gong, Larry Martin, David Burnham, and Amanda Falk proposed that a feathered dromaeosaurid dinosaur from the early Cretaceous period called Synornithosaurus was venomous based on a few pieces of evidence including its longer than normal teeth for an animal its size, grooves along its teeth that would have used to guide the venom to the bite wound, and an empty pocket inside the dinosaur's skull that could have been used to store a venom gland. Along with a possible venom duct that connected the gland to its mouth. This may not have been the case though because a paper written by Federico Giannichini concluded that all of the evidence that pointed towards a venomous dinosaur have explanations that don't include venom. As far as his grooved teeth and empty pocket meant to possibly store its venom gland in, these features are actually seen in other theropod dinosaurs that don't show any evidence of being venomous. And as far as his long teeth go, apparently they had just fallen out of their sockets a bit, so they looked bigger than they actually were. These counter arguments against the possibility of a venomous dinosaur was pretty damning, even to the point where the team that proposed the idea originally had expressed their doubts for their own claims and submitted a new paper in 2010 where they disputed a lot of the things they said initially. Polygenist Theory there's a theory called monogenesis that all humans share a single common ancestor which is something that wasn't very accepted back when it was first proposed. Scientists like Ernst Haeckel and Henry Fairfield Osborne thought that human races were too distinct for that to be the case. So the idea of polygenesis was suggested, which was the idea that each human race had a different primate ancestor that they came from. From what it sounds like from the sources I've read, it seems like this was something that was actually believed, but also meant to push the idea of trying to further separate other races from whites specifically, and justify treating non-whites as lesser people if they were considered to be people at all at that point, which resulted in this theory falling into the category of scientific racism. The idea itself branched into some interesting areas of science and or myth, one notable example being one anthropologist by the name of Carlton S. Kuhn, who was an advocate for the polygenist idea to the point where he wrote a couple of books on the origins of the human race, where he suggested the theory that there were five major and distinct races of man before the Homo sapiens even gave rise, which is a theory that is now said to be widely neglected by scientists. But that's not even the most interesting part. Kuhn also believed in the existence of Sasquatch but often looked at the creature from a perspective of science and anthropology rather than a perspective of myth and conspiracy. However, this led him to suggest that the existence of the Sasquatch could explain the origins of certain human races, specifically Native Americans. Richard Sharp Shaver Rock Books Richard Sharp Shaver was a very interesting man. He was an American writer who wrote some stories for the popular science fiction pulp magazine called Amazing Stories, which may have been fictional to us, but not really to him. In 1943, he would contact the editors working for Amazing Stories, claiming that he discovered an ancient language called Mantong, which would also be the source for every other language known on Earth. The team didn't take it very seriously and threw the letter away, but one editor named Ray Palmer actually contacted Shaver for more information. 
Shaver would then continue with other extremely wild claims in the form of a 10,000 word document to the Amazing Stories team. And in that document, he said that at one point in Earth's history, aliens had invaded and left behind two groups of creatures. One called the Teros, who were more humanoid, and the other called the Daros, which are described as sadistic robots both of which lived in an underground cave system hidden away from the rest of the world. Shaver claimed that he had been held prisoner by the Daros group, who would bring humans down to their lair to torture, kill, and eat them. Palmer took this document, re-edited, and rewrote it to better fit the Amazing Stories tone and would eventually publish it in the magazine in the 1945 March issue. And this story was a hit, going as far as having its own distinct name given to it by fans, which they called the Shaver Mystery. But I'm derailing too much from what this entry is actually trying to refer to. Shaver was very much a believer in everything he wrote. He believed in this underground world that he was held prisoner in, even though Palmer actually revealed that Shaver was at one point treated for schizophrenia and was admitted to a mental hospital. However, one of the things that Shaver would do was actively search for something called rock books which were pieces of information that were inscripted into rock materials by an ancient civilization that existed before us. Or at least that's what Shaver claims. And Shaver used this as physical evidence to prove the existence of aliens. Shaver would document all of this by taking photographs of it, writing books about them, and even recreated them by making his own paintings of them. But this area of his work never tracked in that much attention. Which is weird, because you'd think that'd be one of the most interesting ones. But again, and his most popular works were of his stories for Amazing Stories. Dinosaur Extinction Caused by Eggshell Pathology Eggshell pathology is the study of various effects to an egg including disease, illness, deformity, injury, and so on. In this case, scientists looked at an example of fossilized eggshells from the late Cretaceous period and noticed that some of them, specifically from Hypsellosaurus, were abnormally thinner than most. Over evaporation from the embryo is more likely to happen with thinner eggshells, putting the baby dinosaurs at risk of dying. And it's thought that this was caused by environmental changes happening during this point in time, which also could have affected other eggs from other nests, which could have led to the dinosaur's extinction. Jefferson's Mammoths Thomas Jefferson, better known as the United States' third president, was apparently very much obsessed with mammoths. More specifically, American mastodons, but at the time they were thought to have been mammoths. But he would always talk and theorize about them, even at one point claiming they were still around at that point in time and was convinced they were carnivorous animals that roamed the Wild West. It even got to a point where Jefferson would include the mammoth in a petty slander war he was having with French naturalist George Buffon. Buffon was writing a massive book series on natural history, and when he got to his fifth volume, he wrote it about American natural history, but not in a very respectable way. Really, he was trying to posit the idea that the American wildlife was a lot worse than the wildlife in every other part of the world. He even titled his volume Theory of American Degeneracy, which as an American myself, I can't lie, it's, it's a pretty fitting title. All jokes aside, the argument that Buffon was making was that no American animals could compare to the much more unique animals from around the world like elephants, hippos, tigers, giraffes, lions, etc. The thing is, Buffon wasn't even trying to anger Jefferson or anything. His dislikes against America and how they were approaching natural sciences were for other reasons, and Jefferson just kind of became obsessed with it on the sidelines. But he would get directly involved after several years of gathering information on American wildlife, even writing his own book about it called Notes on the State of Virginia, where he would compile a list of the largest American wildlife that trumps European wildlife, at least in size. One of the animals were mammoths, to which Jefferson proudly claimed they had still been living somewhere in the West and were much stronger and more dangerous than any animal in Europe. Frozen Dinosaurs 
This is referring to the rumor that there are dinosaurs out there preserved in ice, similar to that of the frozen Siberian mammoth specimen. One example of this was a 1930s case of a reptilian animal found preserved within ice on Glacier Island, Alaska. A fox farmer had discovered the specimen, which he described to be in good condition, and instead of reporting it, the first thing the farmer did was hack into it with sharp tools and fed the meat to his foxes. Word about this creature would get around, and a team of experts were sent to document document it, to which they did, but not long after the creature was washed back out to sea, never to be seen again. It should be noted that this is definitely a case associated with cryptozoology, so its existence is up in the air. Halley's Music of the Rolling World after studying the periodic magnetic pole shift, Edmund Halley developed the theory of concentric spheres, which basically meant that the Earth was somewhat hollow, but had contained smaller concentric spheres within one another that had a structure comparable to a Russian doll. And all of these spheres would simultaneously rotate, producing a seismic sound that Halley picked up on, at least that's what he claims, and gave it the name Deep Music of the Rolling World. Neolysenkoism Initially introduced in the 1940s, the concept of Lysenkoism was derived from Neo-Lamarckism, and was applied to environmental and agricultural sciences. It was an idea created by Trofim Lysenko, a Soviet scientist who claimed that the environment alone shapes plants and animals, and would apply this logic to various Soviet crops with disastrous consequences. Lysenko was known to despise and reject the idea of genetics, and was clouded by his own scientific and political biases to see any wrong with his own ideas. Basically, he put all hope in the crops to rely on environmental cues to thrive on their own, and started to teach the crops how to grow in different times of the year by putting them under different environmental conditions. Soviet leaders, including Joseph Stalin, loved the idea and got Soviet farmers from all around to participate, which of course backfired and failed horribly. What resulted was famine, starvation, and deaths of several millions of people. Despite the horrible outcome and criticism towards the awful idea, Lysenko's name was still held in high regard from Soviet leaders, but his influence would die down after Stalin's death and wouldn't ever be the same by the time he himself passed away in 1976. But recently, Lysenkoism has gone through a bit of a revival, with people using the idea of epigenetics to support it. Epigenetics, the study of changes made in organisms based on changes of gene expression rather than their genetic code, is used to explain how many genes are not always active, but whether they are active or not can be determined on environmental cues, which could lead to changes within organisms. There are more examples of this, but basically it comes down to people defending the Lysenkoism idea while others still consider it to be more under the category of pseudoscience. Astropaleontology this is exactly what it sounds like. Astropaleontology is the study of prehistoric extraterrestrial life. The idea was first brought up in the 70s from a paper called The Prospect of Astropaleontology, written by John Armitage, who says that it is likely there were several now extinct galactic civilizations more than there are alive now on Earth, not to mention the possibility of other non-sapient life out there. This in some way was kind of prophetic, because years later the whole Martian false from Antarctica ordeal would happen, leading to people to think of the possibility of ancient life on other planets. Now of course the Martian rock is considered to have nothing organic in it at all, but the idea of astropaleontology still stands. But even Armitage admitted himself that his paper wasn't properly followed, so the field as a whole is kind of in the background of everything else. Ray Stanford, Psychic Paleontology Amateur paleontologist Ray Stanford is a self-taught fossil tracker, who's known for his strange yet incredible ability for finding dinosaur fossils, most notably the chunk of rock containing fossilized trackways of eight different species of prehistoric animals. He's become a common name amongst paleontologists not just because of his ability, but also because he's considered to be controversial in some areas. 
I will say I haven't found much on this, but according to the Google document, which is the guide that I kind of use alongside for this entire iceberg, it mentions how Stanford claims to have had telepathic encounters with extraterrestrial life, to which they would eventually give him the ability to find fossils. Again, I don't know how likely that is, but I thought it was worth mentioning just due to how weird and interesting it is. Oh, and also, Stanford is a huge believer of extraterrestrial life and claims to have seen UFOs a time or two. So yeah, he's, uh, he's an interesting person. And that was the second part of tier three of the paleontology fringe theories iceberg. Man, some of those things on here were just downright weird, so <laughs> I can't wait to see what else we have in the in the future tiers. As always, I just wanna thank you all for your patience. I know I took a little longer with this one than usual, but you guys know how it is. I just wanted to focus on other content and get other projects going. I also recently hit 40K subs and I wanted to do a special for that, but uh, that's currently still being worked on. Even though I said I was gonna try to get it done before the end of July, but uh, I don't think that's gonna be the case. Which is fine because I, I've never been one to stick to a specific schedule anyways. Maybe just expect that special sometime in August. I also really want to get some bigger projects going, ones that I've been planning to do for a long time and ones that I meant to start earlier, but I've decided to wait because I wanted to put all my main focus on this episode of Paleontology Fringe Theories. So maybe expect another longer break between this episode and the next, just in case I decide to do that. Again, I just, I really appreciate you guys so much for everything, for your patience, for your support, and for helping me get to 40k subs. I know, I'm taking forever on that special, I'm taking forever on all my content. I'm sorry guys, I'm one person, I wish I could do more. I, 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 trust me, I really do. I'm doing the best I can. Thank you all so much for watching, and please, have a nice day.